We have an update to the motor shield. Uh, it's a very small update. Basically, um, I added a VIO register, a uh, VIO um, selection jumper. So if you're using it with three volt or five volt Arduino compatibles, it'll work. The logic level for the I squared C will work either way, which I think people like. Um, otherwise, you know, for 99% of people, you're not going to notice a difference. Also updated the silk screen. Um, so this is now back in stock. All right. Tricky. Trinkies. Okay. I got a lot of SAMD 21 E18s. And so we're going to see a bunch of Trinkies coming out. Uh, this is the first one. This is uh, by request. Two versions of kind of the same Trinkie. Um, it's got the SAMD 21 power supply, a little NeoPixel, a reset button, and then an SHT41 or on this one. We have an SHT45. This is basically, it's, well, sorry, not basically. They are completely code compatible. In fact, your code can't tell which one you've got. The SHT41, I think, is like 1.8% uh, humidity precision, and the SHT45 is 1%. So a little bit higher quality. Uh, some people really want, you know, the, the extra precision that you get with the SHT45. Either way, uh, when you plug it in, um, this is an Arduino and CircuitPython compatible microcontroller board. You plug it in and immediately start spitting out the temperature and humidity data, which you can then cool. use to plot or to graph. I need it for now. On a yo, or you can um, you know pipe that data into Excel, or you can log it with Python, or you can use it in Visual Basic. Whatever you just basically get uh, the data coming out of USB um, is a, a comma separated value file. There's also a touch sensor on the end uh, that will that gold area. If you touch it, it's a sensor, so you can use it as a secondary input um, if you want. There's a little keychain slot if you want to tie it to something. Um, and it's just meant to be a very inexpensive way to just get precision temperature and humidity data into your computer. And you don't have to do any coding or soldering or wiring because it's just like plug and play ready to go. Um, so we'll do a couple of projects with this, but I think there's a lot of people who are like, oh, I just want to get temperature and humidity data. And then of course, if you want it to be further away than your computer, just use a USB-A extension cable, which we have in stock with yeah. those three meter ones. Um, and then you can put this anywhere you like and measure the temperature and humidity that way. Okay. This is probably similar. This is the same thing, but this is the 45. So it's two versions. Yeah. Blue is the lower precision. Black is the higher precision. But again, code-wise, it's identical. Okay. And then next up, one of my favorite companies, because it's a cause and a business. Yes. I fix it. I fix it. Um, always fighting for right to repair. Uh, they also uh, make some really great products. So they were like, hey, you know, we have new stuff you could carry. And I'm like, oh, yeah. We carry some of their spudgers and toolkits. Um, so this is their... Um, magnetic mat with an ESD bin um, area. And so it's, you can come to the marker, you can write on it. Uh, it's got this beautiful like blue architectural background. Um, it also has these little uh, bins at the top where you can put components and it's ESD safe. So it's great for chips um, and it's magnetic. So if you put screws and hex nuts and things like they won't roll off and fly off into you know the middle of your room, they'll stay put which I think is really nice. Um, it's also apparently stackable. So if you have multiple of these, you can like put one on oh, top cool. of the other and like your parts won't get disturbed. Um, so I thought it was a really nice upgrade. We already carry their magnetic mat, but this is kind of like an upgrade to the magnetic mat. Okay, next up. Next up, they also make um, a really nice anti-static strap and they're like, this strap not only is it a very good anti-static strap, but it's um, will fit larger wrists than most off the shelf ones are like, yeah. oh, the ones that are often made for uh, people working in Asia, which is kind of where a lot of electro electronic manufacturing is done. They're smaller wrists, but if you want bigger wrists, this one's adjustable. Don't forget, you have to clip the clip part to an earth ground. Um, and a lot of electronics workbenches have like an earth ground exposed. Like you plug it into the wall to light the lamp, but then there's also a place you can clip your anti-static straps. So just don't forget you have to do that. You don't leave it dangling. It has to clip onto something. Um, but once done, you can keep the wrist strap on and you are earth grounded. Okay, next up. Next up, we also have, it's a really great idea. It's yeah, a very just... inexpensive, simple tool. It's got a magnetic base. So of course you can like easily attach it to your desk. All it does is it like grips two little things. Uh, and it's a cool saying on the back, two wires. And now you can uh, splice the wires together with soldering and you don't have to like hold it with one finger and like your thumb is holding yeah. the solder and like your other hand is getting burnt because you slipped. 
Um, and it's made out of silicone, so it's you can you know you don't have to worry about accidentally melting it. So it's like a really nicely made wire holder splint for soldering cables, wires, or even like components if you want to like have solder tails on them. Um, probably also good for holding stuff while you're doing um, uh, you're heating it up with heat shrink. Yeah. So all together, a nice little tool. So it's all three, handy. Yeah, three very nice tools yeah. like from I Fix It. Also, like if someone's just doing electronics, these are look cool. These are good things to get them going. Yeah, and like, are, and these are not included in that toolkit that we just covered on INFPI. So yeah, this would be a great addition. And you know, if you want to support a company that's um, out there making right to repair, an important thing for people to know about, support the company. That's so, right. Yeah. I love them. Okay. Next also, up. great looks. Okay, now we got a whole bunch of Adafruit products. So the first one is this is the TCRT one thousand breakout board. Um, and you can see, uh, I'll show the sensor later. Uh, yeah, I'll actually go to this photo. Okay, so this one. On the end here is a right angle optical sensor and there's like two little eyes and they look so adorable. They're like little googly eyes, but really one is an IR transmitter and one is an IR photo transistor. What happens is that one half, the LED half like beams out light and then it bounces off some object and then will bounce back into the other eye, which gets detected. And then you know that there's something in front of the eye. It's basically an analog, you know, proximity slash distance slash, you know, obstruction sensor. Not meant for big distances. It's like good up to like maybe five millimeters or so. Um, but what's nice is that especially if you, the reason I got this is that if you're trying to measure something that's rotating and you have a reflective metal strip, around it and then like a little black mark like a sharpie mark it'll not reflect off that black mark and so you'll know when it's spinning so it's good for like detecting rotation um as well as proximity so on the animation um you can see in the bottom left there's a little red led that's a signal so as you get closer that'll get brighter and brighter because that's indicating that the um, amount of voltage that's getting generated from the reflected back light is higher um Sorry, it's lower. It, should, it goes. Yes, it goes down when something is nearby. So it's it's reverse polarity because it's a transistor. Um, there's a potentiometer in the middle, so you can adjust the LED current. Uh, you can adjust it from one milliamp up to hundred milliamps, which is the max range. Um, this is one of the few right angle optical reflective sensors we have. You know, some breadboardy ones, but you have to like connect the resistors and you have to wire it up. This is kind of all in one, it's ready to go. You can plug a JST um, PH two millimeter pitch cable in and just like you're ready to go. Or you can solder to the wires, um, to the pins on the board. Either way, um, this is a very easy way to get started with a uh, photo reflective sensor. Okay, and the Starter Shapes and Exercise Relay Data, our customers, our team, and everybody who shares and make things go in this world. Okay. This is the uh, LTC, oh my goodness, wait, now I have to remember the part number. Can you go to the back? I don't, I don't get it wrong. LTC 4316. Thank you. So I can go back here. Okay, so this is a really interesting chip from Linear, uh, which means it's a little expensive, but it's it's interesting enough that maybe it's, it's worth it. Um, now owned by Analog. So the LTC 4316 is an on-the-fly I2C address translator. So why the code is translator? Um, so if you use I2C devices, you probably have the experience of, um, you know, I have a device that is I2C address OX38, and I can't change the address. Um, it's, you know, fixed. Sometimes you have little address jumpers, but usually not. So if you want to use two of them, or maybe you have two devices that have the same address, you can't share the same I2C bus. Every device has to have a unique address. This is going to be fixed in I3C, but we're, we're not there yet. Still using I2C for a lot of stuff. Well, um, sometimes you have two I2C buses, you know, just have two buses and one, each one, um, you know, talks to each sensor. Sometimes that's not possible either. And so this is chip, it's, it's kind of a solution. So on the left side is the input port and on the right side is the output port. And so there's basically, you know, it, it translates between the two buses and in between is a little bit of logic that if, it sees an address on the coming in from the left side. It will twiddle some of the bits before sending the address onto the right. And it only does this for the address bits, which means that basically the controller connected to the left side, your microcontroller, your Raspberry Pi, will see a different address on the device side 
but the device has no idea. The device is like, it thinks like, hey, I'm good to go. So this is a little example just showing a cutie pie board. Oh, can you like zoom out a little bit? Because it's a little cut off. I don't know. Yeah, I can, 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 you know what I mean? yeah, I can zoom out. Or zoom. Yeah, you want, you want, zoom out. You want me to do this? Yeah, because it was uh, just because it's showing the, all the devices. Okay. So in this image, you've got on the top left a cutie pie board, you know, whatever has a stomach QTI squared C output. And then it connects to an HT20, which has a fixed address. It's a temperature humidity sensor. And then the translator, and then another HT20. And this Stubic QT board, the controller, will see one on address OX38. That's the first one. And then through the translator, it'll see another one at address OX58 because you've flipped a couple of the bits. It's a very interesting chip, you know, because again, it does it on the fly. Um, you don't need to use a uh, expander or multiplexer where you have to like tell it no i want you to change it's like it's totally transparent to the controller um and the way you set the bits is if you click on the back the only thing is to set the bits is a little bit weird uh, it uses voltage dividers and there's a high divider and a low divider and as i went through this in one of the videos it's a little bit complicated the upshot is I couldn't make it so you can change any bits easily. It would have made a gigantic board with like tons of switches and resistors. So instead, the board will always flip the highest bit address bit, A6, and you can switch four or five with the dip switch on the front. So basically, every address will always have A7, sorry, A6 flipped, and then you can also flip A4 or A5. So it basically gives you four options. Um, for different addresses, which I think will cover, you know, 90% of cases. And if you still need more address options, there's a little spot for the XORL, the low XOR bit, uh, three bits, and you can solder in a 10K resistor or 50K resistor, 47K resistor, and it'll let you flip other bits as well, according to the data sheet, which is, check the data sheet. There's a table showing all the resistances you need and what bits will get flipped depending on the resistance. Interesting chip. Uh, could people ask for it? Again, it's not as inexpensive as a multiplexer. And a multiplexer will give you, you know, up to eight, four, eight options. But this is, you know, a nice transparent way of um, changing the address. So I thought it was kind of a, a, you know, a cool hack. Another warning: I don't believe it uh, supports clock stretching. So because that's probably going to confuse the heck out of it. And uh, secondly, it does, you know, it obviously doesn't support um, what's called multi-master where there's bi-directional um, I squared C. And uh, the third thing it doesn't support is, uh, well, thing to watch out for is the driver for the device has to let you select the new address. So if your driver has a fixed address in the firmware and you can't change it because it's not expecting you to be able to change it because it was like, why would you have a different I squared C address? You're going to have to go into the code and edit it to change that up. So, you know, a couple of things to watch for, but still a very cool, weird chip. So um, that'll be useful for, for some people and uh, it's in the shop now. <laughs>